Hello everybody, welcome back to our platformer series. Today we're going to change our little green square into an actual player sprite. We're going to use uh, three different player sprites, one to make him run, one to make him jump and fall, and one for when he's just standing around. And we're going to make him change direction and overlap properly with our walls. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is actually bring in our new artwork. I'm not going to draw that live in these videos, I'm just going to bring in some artwork I've made earlier. It's very simple stuff, I just made it using the basic sprite tools in Game Maker. So I'm going to go, I'm not going to create a new sprite, I'm just going to go to our player sprite, S player. I'm going to hit the import button and bring in this little dude. This dude's going to be our player, you might remember him from when I previewed the game we're going to make. Um... This is going to be our guy drawn very badly. You'll notice he has no arms at the moment, but um, we'll, we'll solve that later on when we kind of give him a weapon to play with. Um, I'm going to leave his origin in the center for now. Um, what I am going to do though is open up Collision Mask, and you'll see at the moment I open that up, it draws like a preview gray box uh, around the the sprite. That's uh, where it will register collisions at the moment. So it just like kind of makes a box and uh, sort of tightens it around the non-transparent areas of the sprite. Um, what we're going to do though is we're going to make, we're going to handle this manually instead of sort of this automatic one because um, we don't want collisions to happen here or here. We're going to shrink it down a bit, okay? I'm going to uh, select mode here and select manual and it'll give you these little handles in the corner that will allow you to just drag and reshape the collision box how you want it. And I'm going to make it something like like this. Now you can have your collision box however you want for whatever sprite you're going to use for this tutorial. Um, uh, I will upload the sprites that I'm using for the tutorial so you can download them from uh, the description of the video or whatever. But um, it's best generally, unless you know what you're doing, uh, to go for a small collision box. Um, always err on the side of having a collision box smaller um, than it should be realistically, than having it bigger than it should be realistically for all sorts of different game design and um, and coding reasons and so on. Um, I mean, it's up to you, but generally it's a good rule of thumb to kind of make it small. So that's the, that's the collision box we're going to use there. Uh, we can close him down now. I'm going to import a couple more sprites, so hit create in sprites this time. I'm going to import a sprite for our player when he's running and another sprite for when he's jumping as well. So I'm going to call this S player and then capital R for running. Okay, I'm going to click import and bring in um, this sprite here, S player R strip 4. Um, one thing that's kind of interesting about importing sprites is if you include the word strip at the end of your file name and then a number, uh, Game Maker automatically realizes that that's a strip image and will break it down into frames for you. So you see this image, this is just one complete image that's, uh, that's like for this dude just in a row, very evenly spaced out, um, animated in kind of a running sequence, just a little sprite sheet. Uh, but because it has the word strip four at the end, instead of importing it as just one image, it'll automatically break it down into four images. So it's the word strip and then the number of frames you want to break it down into. So if I import that, click yes, you'll see it automatically comes in with all four sprites and a little animation like that. So if I hit play, I can see my little running animation on this dude. Okay, I'm not going to change the collision mask on this one. What I'm going to do later is make it so... Um, all of these sprites just use the collision mask from S player, and we'll see how that works in a minute. So I'll go ahead and close that. Let's create another sprite. Import, I'm going to bring in this guy now. Um, this one's not an animation as such, it's just a sprite um, where I'm going to keep the frames I'm going to use for when I go up. So this is my moving up uh, frame, and this is my moving down frame, okay, when I'm going, when I'm jumping and when I'm falling, okay. I'm going to call it S player. A. So we're never actually going to, A for airborne, we're never actually going to play like this as an animation, like for obvious reasons, um, it's just going to pick between one of these two frames to show when we're, when we're in the air, okay, and we'll see how that works. So a couple of different ways of working with sprites here, we've got a still image, um, an image that's just a collection of uh, sort of state based frames and an actual animation. Okay, okay. so how do we make our player object, who before only had one sprite, move between different sprites. Um, because we replaced our original square, you can see he's already got the, the player sprite going on there. Um, but something, before we get into actually changing the sprite around, 
uh, where it says collision mask here, it says same as sprite at the moment. So it means whatever sprite we've got assigned to the object, it's going to use the collision mask for that sprite. Um, it's obvious why that's the default, but it's not what we want here. So I'm going to click this and select S player. So it always uses the collision mask that we defined in S player, this one for this object, no matter what sprite it's using. Okay. And that just saves us having to manually set all the different collision masks for each sprite. Or, or change each one. Um, like if we wanted to change this one, make it a bit smaller, we won't then have to update all of the others to reflect that as well. Since all of the sprites are just going to be this dude just doing different stuff, the collision mask is always going to be mostly in the same place. Okay, so it just makes a lot of things easier to manage if we use that. So that's all that artwork in. Um, one more thing before we sort of really get started with the animation, I'm just going to go to our room editor, which is just black by default before. Uh, since our, the limbs of our character are black, we want to actually be able to see the animation. So I'm going to go to the background layer and just change the color of this. We'll just turn it into kind of like a sky blue or something. Um, yeah, just just some sort of blue like that, just so we can actually see what's going on. That is a lot brighter. Um, if I run the game now as well, um, we should just have a little player and we can see everything that we need to change. So we've got a player, he can move left and right, jump, this is everything that we did before. Fairly consistent collision mask. And you see there's a couple of problems actually here. You'll notice that our player, because of his uh his collision mask isn't the whole of his sprite, so some of it is gonna overlap with the wall when he walks into the wall, which is fine, but the wall is actually showing ahead of our player here, so we need to reorganize the layers of our room to make sure that our player always appears in front of the wall which will just look a bit better than him sort of slotting behind it like that okay um, the other problem is obviously our character is always facing to the right so we're going to fix that and last but not least obviously our character doesn't animate at all he doesn't do his running animation doesn't do his jumping or falling animation and so on so those are the things we're going to fix um, let's start with just that issue with the walls, shall we? At the moment, all of our objects, our wall objects and our player object are all on the same layer. Uh, when objects are on the same layer, there's no guarantee about what order they'll be drawn in if they're drawn at the same time. If I put the player on top of it, there's no guarantee. It work, It's worked out internally. Um, and like that you even if you get it kind of working how you want it to say like if just by chance our player happened to show up in front of all of these different objects you don't want to rely on that because a later version of game maker might change how it works internally it's it's not something um you can rely upon to always stay the same what you can rely upon is if you put um your objects on the proper layers in the right order and use the correct depth or however you however you're doing it um, then that will always work. Whereas if they're always on the same layer or if they're on the same depth, um, it's not going to be guaranteed. So let's make just a new instances layer, just above, um, in above our current instances layer. So let's change the name of this layer to player. We'll just have a, a layer specifically for the player in this room. Again, we'll change this one to walls. I'm just selecting this layer and pressing F2. If you're wondering how I'm just easily renaming that. Um, and let's select our walls layer and delete the player from the walls layer and put it onto the player layer. And now you can see if we drag him over the top of the walls, he's appearing in front of the wall because he's on a layer that's uh, in front of the walls or on top of the walls layer. Okay, so that will solve that problem. So if, if I were to run the game now, you'd see that as well. We, but you, can, you can see it in the room better that we're crossing over the wall properly. So let's actually get into the code and start writing the stuff for our animation now, shall we? So let's go to our player object. Um, let's open the step event. I'm just going to press F12. In fact, I'm going to maximize this so we can see just 100% of our screen space is uh, used for this code. I'll um, make the font a bit bigger as well. I'm just pressing F8 there, by the way, in case you also wondered. F8 and F7 um, just dynamically increases and decreases the size of your font so you can clearly see. Um, all of your code however you want to. Now we want to animate and we want to we want to change our sprite of our object and change our animation speed and change what frame we're showing and so on based on different things. Now you might think that we just sort of wrap that into our code so at the moment we've got this area here that's like oh if we're if we're on the floor and we press jump let's jump right so maybe it would make sense that here 
we could put the change sprite to be our jumping animation thing. It's not really how you want to do it. Or, I mean, you can do it that way, but it becomes hard to manage if you've got all your animation stuff just sort of wrapped in with all your code. It becomes hard to work out uh, which animations are taking priority over which and what's happening in what order. So what I usually like to do, um, and you can do this however you want really, but what I like to do is keep all of that stuff separate. So I have a separate section just at the end. Once I've worked out all of my movement and all of my positional stuff, right at the end of the step, um, I have a section for animation, okay? And that's and that includes just changing our sprite, changing our frames, um, and, and doing anything to do with uh, the graphics of the sprite, okay? Um, the reason I do that is it just makes it easy to sort of maintain the logic of what I'm doing with the sprite and uh, easy for me to keep track of what's going on. So I'm just going to do it all down here. So the first thing I'm going to do is check to see if we're on the floor because if we're not on the floor, um, that makes things very easy. If we're not on the floor, we're going to want to use our uh, air sprite, our S player A sprite. And we're going to want to either use the up frame or the down frame, depending which direction we're going, okay? So I'm going to say if, open bracket, not, okay? By putting an exclamation mark in front of the condition, I'm saying if it's not true, just as we did with our while statements here, where I put an exclamation mark in front of place meeting. So if not place meeting x, y plus 1, o oh, wall. So this is exactly the same thing that we wrote up here, okay, where we were checking to see if we were on the floor so we, we could jump. It's exactly the same, only we're checking if it's not true rather than checking if it is true. Now, um, if you're a bit more experienced, you might realize that this is actually slightly not the most efficient way of doing things, like doing, you should try and minimize the number of collision checks you do, especially with the number of wall objects we've got going on. We might look into a better collision system later down the line in general for this game, but uh, for now we're just using this. Um, but because like we've done this check once, okay, x, y plus one wall, we shouldn't really do it again if we can avoid it, which we could by saying if we did this check, setting like a variable, like on the floor, for example, as a variable, like if I did like on the floor equals one when we're touching the floor, um, although I would then have to get rid of this and key jump so it only does it when we're touching the floor, not just when we do that and press jump and so on. And then instead of doing another check later on, we could just check that variable, which is faster. It's faster to check a variable than it is to do a whole nother collision check, okay, code-wise. Something to kind of bear in mind, but it's not too important right now. This is a very simple game. We don't really have to worry too much about the, the very minute details of performance and efficiency. We can we can be a little bit careless for the sake of making things clear and easy to understand. So I'm not going to you know, spend ages trying to make things super efficient, just in case some of you are watching this with a bit more code experience and be like, why did you do it like that? that that's why. I'm just trying to keep things straightforward, okay? So sorry for that little tangent, but back down here, what we were doing before. So if not place meeting x, y plus one, oh wall. So if there's not a collision, one pixel immediately below us, okay? So what do we want to do if there's not a collision, one pixel immediately below us? Well, it means we're in the air. So one thing we can definitely do is say sprite index equals s player a, okay? So what does that mean? Well, it's taken the sprite index, but you can see turns green, and as we know, a green thing is a property of the object that we're writing uh, this code for. So property of O player, in this case, our sprite index, which basically tells the object what sprite to use, okay? In the resource tree, all your different sprites, you can set it to different sprites, and that'll tell the object what sprite to use. By default, it's whatever you set it as in the object, which is S player or our idle sprite. So by changing it to S player A, we're going to change to our uh, air sprite, which as you can remember is just an up frame and a, a falling frame, okay? Uh, because of that, we then want to set our image speed to zero. You can see that's turned green, that's another built-in property, that's how fast uh, the animation should happen if you've got multiple frames. But as we discussed earlier, if I go to this sprite, we don't actually want it to animate because that would look like this which is not what we want. 
will want this one to animate, our running sprite, later, uh, because that's an actual animation, but this one we don't want to animate, we just want to pick one of these frames to show, okay? Um, something you might, if you're coming from GameMaker 1.x, um, if you're not, uh, if you're starting in GMS2, don't worry, ignore this little bit I'm just going to say, um, but if you're coming over from 1.x, you might be used to image speed working a little bit differently. Before, image speed used to actually set uh, the, the the number of frames per step essentially so like um, at 60 room speed of 60 an image speed of 1 would actually mean your sprite would animate at 60 frames a second right uh, here the image speed is a multiplier instead it's a multiplier that's applied to the sprite you now actually set the animation speed uh, in terms of frames per second in the sprite itself Okay, well here where it said speed, previously that was just used in GMS1 to preview an animation speed and then you would set it all in objects. Now that actually sets the animation speed of your sprite. So here I've got them at 15 frames a second. It's kind of a, a reasonable animation speed. Makes it easier to kind of like actually set it because you can get it to exactly the frames per second you want and you know that this is what it's actually going to look like in the game, at least when you have an image speed of 1. So if I had an image speed of 2, it would play this at twice the speed, it would play at something like what well, something like that in the game, okay? But because I have this set to 15 and I will have an image speed of 1 when I use it, it'll play it at this speed. Um, whereas with this one, by setting image speed to 0, um, we're going to multiply this 15 by 0 so that we get 0 frames a second, so it's always just still, okay? Um, sorry for that little detour, um, you can ignore that if you're starting in GameX Studio 2, or, or hopefully maybe it made sense to you, <laughs> I don't know. But either way, image speed is a multiplier that affects the speed of your uh, your sprite, which as I said you can set in the sprite resource. So for our air sprite we want that to be zero, we don't want an image speed at all. But how do we know which frame we actually want to use? Well that depends on whether we're going up or down. Now if we're in the air, we're going to have a vertical speed of some description, right? And we want to check to see if that vertical speed is positive or negative. Now we already kind of know how to do that, if you remember from last time. I went a bit quick with this in last time, so sorry if you did forget. Uh, we did sign VSP. The function sign returns 1 if a number is positive and minus 1 if it's negative. Okay, so what I have, all I have to do is check whether or not um, sign uh, VSP is greater than 0, for example. If it's greater than 0, uh, it means it must be 1, which means it must be positive, and if VSP is positive, it means we're moving downwards, okay? It means we're moving uh, positively in the Y direction, which means we're moving downwards. Remember, positive in the Y direction is down, negative in the Y direction is up, okay? So if sign VSP greater than 0, okay? Greater than symbol, 0. So if that's greater than zero, as I said, it means we're moving down. So if we're moving down, we need to use um, the falling frame. So let's go back quickly to this sprite, see which frame is which. So you see our first frame here is our jumping frame, and our second frame is our falling frame. Now, frame indexes start at zero. Even though it says here current frame one of two, in terms of the index, uh, the first frame is frame zero, and the second frame is frame one. Okay, it counts from zero upwards. So like in our four frame sprite, you've actually got zero, one, two, three, for example. Just worth remembering that. Let's go back to our code. So if we are moving down, we want it to be that second frame. The second frame is frame number one, okay? As weird as that might seem. So image index, so image index rather than sprite index. Sprite index determines which sprite we're using image index determines which frame of that sprite we're using, okay? So image index equals one, okay? So if we're moving negatively, uh, we're sorry, if we're moving positively, which means we're moving down, set the frame to be frame one. Otherwise, else image index equal zero. Now, I am apologize if I've not explained I don't think we did this before. I've done what's called an inline if statement. So you remember before when I explained if statements, I said that um, if the condition in the brackets is true, you do whatever's in the curly brackets here. You don't actually have to use those curly brackets. Um, you can actually just put the command you want to do 
immediately after uh, the brackets like that, and that's called an inline if statement. Okay, so that's just one line if statement there. And you see, I ended it with a semicolon there, which tells GameMaker where the sort of line of code officially ends, which means I can actually start coding again right away, even though it's you know physically still on the same line. GameMaker interprets it as kind of the next line. And what I can do is use this else statement. And what else does is basically, if the condition here is not true, um, it'll do this stuff instead, okay? Um, that's different to say just putting it down here, because then if we, if we just put it down here, it would happen regardless of whether or not this was true. But by putting it after an else statement, it's only gonna do it if this is not true, okay? So if it is true, do this. If it's not true, do that. Something else I should point out with semicolons as well that might have been a tripping point for people in the first part of the tutorial um, is I remember I said that you put a semicolon at the end of every single line. When you're doing a, uh, a statement like an if statement or a while statement that opens a pair of curly brackets, uh, you don't want to put a semicolon on the end of the line where those brackets open, okay? So not at the end of like an if statement like this or a while statement like this. Um, because you're you're not actually officially sort of ending the line, you're kind of opening things up. I know it gets a little confusing, okay? But um, you put a semicolon at basically the end of every line, except for if statements, while statements, and so on, when you're opening a pair of curly brackets. If I'm doing an inline one, then I do want to put a semicolon on the end, because that's it's just one complete line, it doesn't open a block of code, and uh, we want to tell it to officially end, okay? Um, don't worry too much if you don't understand all the whys and, and hows of that, just understand the rules, um, get used to them, and um, you'll understand it when you need to, okay, <laughs> basically. So anyway, sorry, a few tangents there, but um, basically if our vertical speed is uh, positive, then we set the first frame, if it's negative, then we set the second frame, okay, and then that's our falling animation stuff. Done. In fact, we should be able to basically just see that working now if I run the game. Um, so you can see if I jump now, it uses our jump animation, and if we fall, it swaps to our kind of falling sprite. Okay, so we're getting somewhere now. We've got a little bit of a uh, animation going on now. We just need to sort out our animation from when we're on the floor. Okay. Um, so I'm going to make use of this else statement again, but this time with a block of code. Okay. So if this this condition returns true, so if not place meeting, etc. If that returns true, we do all of this stuff. Um, but what if it doesn't return true? We can type else and do this stuff only when this isn't true, okay? So we're, instead of just doing it afterwards where it would happen regardless by putting it in an else statement, it happens only if this isn't true, okay? So this means we are touching the floor, okay? Because not place meeting x, y plus one wasn't true, okay? So we are touching the floor. In which case we want to set our image speed to be one because we want to be animating. Um, all of our other sprites will want to animate, so we'll set image speed to one. Um, and then we're going to check to see if our horizontal speed is zero. So I'm going to say if HSP equals equals zero. I'm going to open another block and close the block. Okay, I'm just going to press F12, pick up that space a bit more. Um, so you'll notice I've done two equal symbols here when I check this. Okay, the difference between writing two equal signs and a single equal sign is when you're doing a comparison, like you're doing an if statement, like you're asking GameMaker a question. You're saying is horizontal speed equal to zero, you use two equal signs. Um, if you're assigning, so you're saying image speed equals zero, so you're setting a property to be something else, then you use a single equal sign, okay? So it's the difference between assigning, setting, and comparing or asking a question, right, okay? Um, it doesn't matter too much, GameMaker will let you get away with doing that, like if HSB equals zero, but it is bad practice. And the reason I say it's worth doing things that are good practice is if you ever move on to into other programming languages where it does matter, you'll already have good habits in place if you do things properly from the beginning, okay? So if HSP equals equals zero, so 
is our horizontal speed zero? And if it is zero, um, well, what on earth do we want to do? We want to set our sprite index to s player, which is our idle sprite. That's the default sprite we were using initially, because it means we're on the floor and we're not moving anywhere. So we just set our sprite index to be uh, our default one. And then we're going to open up another else statement. Because I'm going to say else, open curly bracket, close curly bracket. Oh, and remember, of course, this should say equals one. <laughs> I forgot to put the equal sign in there. Um, so if our horizontal speed is not zero, um, whatever we put in here is going to happen because this is our else statement. So if it's not zero, then we want to use our running sprite. Okay, so it's going sprite index equals s player r this time. Okay, that's our running sprite. So if the speed is zero, idle sprite. If it's not zero, running sprite. All right. Um, that's more or less it. If I press F5, there is one thing we still need to do, but we'll see that in a second. So if I land, you can see I jump, I fall, and if I run, I actually use a running animation. Now the only problem is, if I move left, uh, I don't face the right direction. Oh, and you can also see that layering stuff we did earlier is working as well, because we show up over the top of the walls. Um, so now the last thing we need to do to really sort of finish this off is make it so we actually face the correct direction, okay? So how on earth do we do that? Well, you'll notice all of my sprites face to the right. Um, maybe I should have pointed this out earlier in case you're following along and designed your own sprites, but if, whenever you're doing anything where you think you're gonna have to flip a direction or change rotation, even if you're doing top-down sprites, um, always design the sprite initially facing to the right, okay? That's very good practice. You'll see why later. Um, but because we have all these sprites facing to the right, um, what I could do is draw a separate sprite having him face to the left, um, especially if I had stuff on him that wasn't going to mirror very well, like he had a letter or a word on his chest or something like that, then maybe I would want to um, design a proper left facing sprite. But because he looks like this, I can pretty much just flip him left and uh, like flip him horizontally and it, I'll probably get away with that. It'll look okay. So that's all I'm going to do, rather than actually making another separate sprite. Um, so how do I do that? Well, there's a property, another green um, green word we can use. Um, oh, not in here, we'll just do it after this whole section. Um, called image x scale. Okay, um, image x scale uh, determines our horizontal scaling of our sprite. Okay, if we set it to, it's kind of a percentage sort of based thing or a multiplier based thing. So if it's one, uh, that's like 100%. So 100% scaling, um, that's our, our normal default scaling. He'll draw at the same size as the sprite. If we set it to two, um, I can show you what that looks like. If we set image X scale to two, we'll see that we've got a super wide horizontal sprite. Okay, it's just gone a bit fat. And you can change Y scale as well to scale them vertically, but we don't need that. Uh, the interesting thing about this being a multiplier is if we set it to a negative number, so I set it to minus one, he'll face the other direction. So you can see now he's facing to the left, just just constantly. It, it just vert it horizontally flips the sprite. Okay. Oh, and the semicolon on the end should be there as well. Um, but we want to do this based on whether or not we're moving left or right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to type if HSP. Uh, is not zero, okay? Um, because we don't want to change our direction if we're not moving. We just want to leave it at whatever it was before. Image x scale equals sine hsp. Because you can remember, sine of anything returns one if it's positive, minus one if it's negative. You can tell by now it's a very very useful function. It gets used quite a lot. Um, if it's one. Uh, that means we, we're, we're facing to the right, right? Uh, if we set our image x scale to 1, that faces us to the right, as I demonstrated. If we set it to minus 1, um, it, it'll flip us around and face us to the left. And by just basing that on our horizontal speed, when our horizontal speed is positive, it's because we're moving to the right, and when it's negative, we're moving to the left. Um, so that's a really perfect, elegant way of working out which direction we need to face and setting our image x scale accordingly. So now if I run the game, we have everything, okay? We can move left and right. We've got a running animation, jumping, falling animation, and 
our hitbox works perfectly and you can see we overlay properly we don't go underneath the wall and it's all there okay so next up and probably um the next episode we will look at giving our guy some arms okay i'll give him a, a weapon that he can use um show you how to shoot projectiles uh, make a make a weapon that follows the mouse and do all sorts of other fun stuff okay um thank you very much for watching i'll catch you guys next time as always a big shout out to my patreon supporters without whom i couldn't make any of these videos a uh, special shout out in particular to inner mule giles montgomery dan angel rodriguez harold gidry Roxom, jason mcmillan and owen morgan hopefully i didn't mispronounce any of those um sorry if i did uh thank you again very much for watching and if you enjoyed this video, maybe subscribe. If you really, really like it, maybe join these cool kids by supporting me on Patreon. Of course, these are just suggestions. You can do whatever you want. That's what free content is there for. Isn't the internet brilliant? Thanks for watching, guys. See you next time.